Exodus chapter 17 picks up the story of the Israelites and Moses leading the Israelites partway through. So, so where are we at? The Israelites are a slave nation. That's all this generation have known. That's all their parents have known. That's all their grandparents have known. That's all their great-grandparents have known. 400 years of slavery. They haven't known anything else. And, and God called them out of uh, slavery in a country called Egypt. You might have heard of it. Into a new land called Israel or the promised land, different words for it, um, but we'll call it Israel probably. When they get to Israel, they are going to face some problems. They're going to face some serious, serious issues. There are people living in Israel that are awful, absolutely awful. They're mean, they're violent, they're fierce, they're brutal. Uh, One of their practices, when they want to talk to their gods, they'll take one of their children and they'll sacrifice their child. They'll kill their child to talk to their god, to appease their god. And so the true God said to Israel, I'm taking you into this promised land and you're going to wipe them out. You're going to take over this land. I don't want these evil people in this incredible place anymore. But Israel's not ready to do that. And so they march out of Egypt. And as they march towards Israel, the land of Israel, the people of Israel marching to the land of Israel, God prepares them for what they're about to face. So he prepares them by teaching them to trust in him. You know, at the Red Sea, they, they're driven out of the land by Pharaoh. Pharaoh says, I've had enough of you, get out. They get to the banks of the Red Sea. Pharaoh says, actually, I've lost all my labor force. I want you back. And so he goes chasing after them. Moses, the people of Israel, see the army coming after them, see the sea in front of them and God says, you know that rod in your hand that stick, stretch it out over the sea and voila, it opens they go through, dry land the Egyptian army comes through afterwards and God says, you know I've only got this opening for the Israelites, I'm shutting it for the Egyptians and he closes the gate with the Egyptians stuck in the gate if you get what I mean incredible story, so they go off with great faith and trust in God or beginning faith and trust in God Before Moses, they possibly didn't even have a relationship with the living God. Lots of them would have followed the gods of the Egyptians. So they had to learn to trust in God, to know him, to understand his power. And God displays his power more than he ever had um, since the creation of the world for this this generation of Israel. It's incredible. they get into the desert, they run out of water, they run out of food. God provides, God provides. Um, then, they, as they're in the desert, they're, they're marching through the desert. They've got their food, they've got their water resource um, resupplied. And then they catch their first glance of civilization outside of Egypt. There's this other nation that, that um, starts coming towards them, this other group of people. I don't know what the Israelites were thinking as they saw it, but I can imagine initially a bit of excitement going on. Here's this new group of people that we get to meet. Uh, They're not from the land that we're about to conquer. They're uh, in a different place and so what's going to happen? They are stuck with two two things to eat. Um, They're stuck with mana and quail to eat. So little birds and funny funny bread, sweet and tasty bread but after quite a few um, meals of that same thing it would get a bit old. They have massive resources. They are an incredibly rich nation. All of a sudden, they can afford to trade. They can buy weapons. They can buy different food. They can buy their chocolate biscuits off them. They can do whatever they want um, with this extra coin. Where did they get their coin from? Well, the Egyptians gave it to them when they left. It's incredible. They gave them their gold. They gave them their jewelry. So here comes this other nation. Let's read about them meeting the other nation. I said we're in Exodus 17, but this actually comes from Deuteronomy chapter 25. Deuteronomy records um, scenes 40 years after Exodus generally. And it looks back at this incident in hindsight. So Deuteronomy 25, 17. Remember what the Amalekites did to you along the way when you came out of Egypt. So the Amalekites are the, the, the people group that they're meeting. When you were weary and worn out, they met you on your journey. Sounding good, isn't it? Weary, worn out. They've come, replenished supplies, whatever. But it says, they met you on your journey and attacked all who were lagging behind. They had no fear of God. These Amalekites were awful, awful, awful people. They went there to trade. They were there to torture. They were to to kill and and, um, destroy them. They hated them. This was a brutal, sudden, unprovoked attack. 
They had no reason to attack. The Israelites weren't going to their land. Um, they had nothing to do with the Amalekites. They weren't even going through their land. But the Amalekites came out. Where did the Amalekites come from, you ask? I hear you asking. You're always going, where did they come from? Well, Amalekites came from a man named Amalek. Who was Amalek, you ask? Well, he was, he was a son of Esau. Esau was a brother to Jacob, um, Jacob, the, one of the fathers of Israel. So Abraham, Jacob. Sorry, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Goodness. Um, Esau hated Jacob. He had a pathological hatred for Jacob. Esau had a few sons, one of them to a... Um, a, a I don't know how to describe it. We don't don't have them today, but one of them, not from his wife, but from a, wom- a woman that he used for, for pleasure and for service. They're called a concubine. And so Esau had a son, and his name was Amalek. Amalek grew up in Esau's house, and he caught his pathological hatred for Jacob and his descendants. And so here they are, as the Israelites are walking along, and they're just picking off the weak links. They're picking off the back of the train, as it were, the, those tired people, those those weary people, the weak, they're just picking them off and destroying them. And I know that we sit here in our comfortable chairs, our lovely pretty chairs, uh, can't get much better than the chairs at this church, and we go, well, we've got no Malachites coming to get us, and we're, we're probably pretty safe from someone trying to kill us, um, probably, most likely, percentage-wise, out of hatred and, and brutality. But we need to remember that we have an enemy far greater than Amalek and the Amalekites. Peter puts it so vividly when he describes our enemy in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Our enemy, the devil. If we change that to not our enemy but your enemy or change that again to my enemy. If you say that to yourself, my enemy, the devil, prowls about like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. The devil's a hungry beast, and it wants to attack you and I. And it's going to attack us at our moments of weakness and at our weakest points. And so we pause, I like asking lots of questions, and and we start off with some questions for ourselves. Am I a soft target? Am I one of those soft targets at the back of the queue? Am I isolated off the back? It really grieves me. If you're listening online because you don't want to go to church at the moment, it really grieves me that you do that. It grieves me that Christians say, I'm just going to stay home and do this on my own. I can get church at home. I can watch that awesome preacher, Andrew, from Church at 109 um, and just do it on my own. I can listen to worship songs. I'm being, I'm being silly, by the way. Uh, you'll find out why in a minute. But we isolate ourselves. We isolate ourselves and, and make ourselves a soft target. How, am I a soft target? Am I isolating myself off the back? What are my points of vulnerability? Do we ask ourselves that? If the devil's going to attack me today, where will it be? Because he knows. And then the final question in this set, what can I do to protect my flanks from the devil's fangs? What can I do to protect my flanks from the devil's fangs? Well, let's see what happens to the nation of Israel. Let's go to Exodus chapter 17. You already are, eh? Exodus 17. Let's pick up the story. Verse 8. It's just one single story. It won't take us too long today, but it's so, so cool. The Amalekites, Exodus 17, 8, the Amalekites came and attacked Israel at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua... Choose some of our men and go out and fight the Amalekites. Tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. So what's going on here is is pretty cool. Moses is getting Joshua to assemble the Amalekites while he goes up, I'm sorry, the Israelites to fight the Amalekites while he goes up the mountain. There's one guy in all of Israel who is equipped and trained for fighting. I'm not sure about equipped. He's experienced and trained uh, leader and fighter. His name is Moses. There's stories of him leading the Egyptian army out there in historical books. 
of, of fighting great battles, of uh, being a military genius. Moses takes himself out of the battle and says, you know what, I'm going up the hill and I'm handing it over to Joshua. Do you guys know Joshua? They didn't. We don't until this part of the Bible. This is the first mention of Joshua in the Bible, my understanding is. He's mentioned after this 200 times, but he's brand new. And he's getting these brand new people to join him in battle. They're unskilled, they're inexperienced, they're not equipped, and they're unprepared. But for the first time in the story of Egypt since they've got out, sorry, of Israel, since they've got out of Egypt, they're obedient. And Joshua's obedient. They're performing unusual obedience. I want to pause here and point out that God is a team player and he's forever drafting rookies, first-timers, people who have never performed before or done anything. He takes people at their weakness and makes them strong. I did... When we lived, um, so our, our journey before we got to Topol was we went to Bible College in Adelaide uh, for three years. And before that, we lived in, in beautiful, sunny Upper Hutt. We lived there. That's, that's silly as well if you're watching on video. Unless you're from Upper Hutt, it is beautiful. Um, while we were in Upper Hutt, we went to a church called the King's Arms Church. And I wanted to be involved, but I didn't know what I was good at. So I took one of those tests, those gift tests. I don't know if you've ever done them before. I don't remember all the results of my gift test. I just remember my weaknesses in the gift test. And so the, the idea is it found out what God had given you that you should use in his service. And you find out your strengths and you go and serve God in your strengths. Well, my two biggest weaknesses were public speaking and leading. So I said, don't do, don't do them, Andrew. Don't do them. Um, what I did from that is I just said to the pastor, Pastor Stu, uh, he's still at the King's Arms, I said to Stu, look, I want to be involved in the church. I don't really know what I should do, just what, what needs doing. So at that time they had some um, public speaking roles, some, some worship leading roles and some leading roles that, were, that had gaps in. And so I, I stepped into there and, and, and God says, you know what, Andrew, I'm going to use your weaknesses and your flaws, and I'm going to take you from that. And God does that with all of us. You know, when we come into a life, or even to the Christianity, we come in a box, unassembled. We come as raw materials into God's kitchen, and he says, I'm going to take you and mold you, and who you are today is not who you'll be tomorrow. I'm just starting with you. I'm just getting going. I take rookies and train them into God's people, to greatness. God's not done with you yet. Uh, one of the ways God trains us, one of the major ways, is letting the devil have a sniff. Putting us through hard, horrible moments. And the devil, when he has a sniff, he, he doesn't want to mess around with you too much. He wants you to uh, disobey God, to walk away from God. So the devil probably doesn't care whether you're a murderer or not. He doesn't want to teach you to be a liar, teach you to be a murderer, teach you to be hater, a hater. He wants you to teach you to not trust God, to not obey God. So the, the way to protect your flank is just to get stuck in and, and obey. Get, get busy in God's work. Get busy in learning from God. And, and get into the battles. Battles give us a great opportunity to trust and obey God. All right, let's carry on in our story. We protect our flanks by obeying God. So, Moses is up the top of the hill, Joshua's down the bottom. How's this battle going to go? How many battles have Israel faced, fought before as a nation? Zero. This is their first ever one. It's incredibly significant. This is going to lay the groundwork for how the rest of the battles are going to go, and for Joshua in particular. So Joshua fought the Amalekites, verse 10, as Moses had ordered. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. What's going on there? That is weird, isn't it? It's almost like a superstition. 
Um, he's got his hands up, they're winning. He's got his hands down, they're, they're losing. What's, what's going on with his hands up, hands down? Well, he's got the staff of God in the air. We'll come back to that later. But, but he's declaring his utter and total dependence on God. I don't know whether he's trying to get his hands closer to God or what's going on with his hands in the air. But for Israel, sometimes when they prayed, they had their hands in the air. And it was a posture of prayer for the Israelites. You see it in um, the dedication of the first temple. Where the first temple come in? Well, once they got into the land, they had a period of time where just different judges came and ruled. And then they had a period of kings that would come and rule the land of Israel. The first king, his name was Saul. Second king, his name was David. The third king, his name was Solomon. And Solomon had the privilege of building a, a magnificent temple for God. And in this temple, it had the holiest of holiest place. And in that holiest place, they had something called the Ark of the Covenant. Within the Ark of the Covenant, um, they had some of the mana bread, uh, or manna bread, sorry, um, inside the Ark of the Covenant. But as that Ark of the Covenant came in, Solomon starts praying. How does he pray? This is all in First Kings chapter 8. He lifts his hands up in the air to God and he prays. And he prays a long prayer. Oh man, I need some deodorant. <laughs> As he's, as he's praying, oh, we're recording the service too. I'm really, I'm really sorry. As he's praying, he prays a long prayer. He's holding his hands in the air the whole time, declaring his utter and total dependence on God. This place is for you, God. This place is for your glory. This is about you. What are we saying here? Are we saying that we need to pray with our hands in the air if it helps? Absolutely. If it declares your utter glory, uh, dependence on God and his goodness and his glory, absolutely. What it's saying is that when you're in a battle, get into prayer. Go to God first. Take your t go to God in the middle. Go to God at the end. Go to God all the way through. You know, battles are one of those ways that God says, I, I want you to depend on me and trust in me more and pray. And so as Moses is praying and seeking the God, God, sorry, God, they're winning. As he stops praying, as his arms drop, it's a symbol of a stop in prayer, the Amalekites start winning. What's the solution to that? Verse 11. I will pick it up halfway through where we were. As long as Moses held his hands, up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held up his hands, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Moses is not just reaching up, he's now reaching out. He's reaching out to Aaron and Hur, and it's Aaron and Hur that come up with the solution. It's Aaron and Hur that says, look, there's a rock, let's move it under Moses. Let's get him to sit down, let's hear him to hold his hands up. And Aaron on one side, Hur, um, I'd recommend, parents, don't name your, your boys Hur. I don't think it's a great name for a boy, but anyway, he's a significant follower of, of, of God and a faithful servant. You'll see him again um, in a few chapters' time. They, they seem to lock Moses' hands into their body and, and hold his hands up. So he's praying. They're probably praying with him. And so the, the final verse there, verse 13, Joshua overcame the Amalekites with the sword. You look at the story, and I look at the story I was asking the youth during the week, who was it that won the battle against the Amalekites? Was it Joshua with the sword? Because without Joshua and the sword, the battle's lost, eh? They get nowhere. Or was it God? Because actually God's the one in, that seems to be intervening and causing the victory. Without God, the Amalekites would prevail. But then God wouldn't act unless Moses was praying with his hands up in the air and the rod of God in his hands. So was it Moses the most important person? But Moses would have his hands down on the ground, drooping down, lying down on the ground, having a kip if it wasn't for Aaron and the man named Hur. Who's the most important person in the story? Well, they all are. The, the victory doesn't happen without all of them. And it's a, it's a big picture for us that God believes Christianity, following him, is a team sport. It's not a solo event. You would never play rugby without a team around you. You'd get smashed every time. 
And then you look at the Bible. How many teams are in the Bible? How many missionary journeys did Paul go out on, on his own? None. How many times in the Bible do you see Paul isolated? Well, maybe a, a very short time in prison when he's begging, send somebody, send someone to me. Most of his time in prison, he actually had company in prison. Not people in prison, but actually people out of prison living with him in house arrest. Look at Jesus. Even for the Son of God, he had to have people around him. People were important to him. He was always interacting with them, serving alongside them and training them. As he started out on his ministry, he grabbed the best team he could for the mission in mind. And so we ask, we're trying to protect our flanks, and so we, we jump into obedience, we reach up, and now we reach out. So two questions in here, or two statements in here. Let yourself be helped. I think this is a thing for guys. We think we're, we're cool and we've got it sorted. And... And, and we don't always let ourselves be helped. And so I've got some questions for us to ask ourselves, some self-reflection questions. Who is vital in your life? Who talks through your troubles? Who prays for you? Who knows where you're vulnerable? Who builds you up? Who shows you unconditional love? If you've answered no one to those questions, can I just point out the obvious? Your flanks are unprotected. You're vulnerable there. Find someone who'll talk through your troubles, who'll pray for you, who will understand your vulnerability, who will build you up and will show you love even when you don't deserve it. Let yourself be helped and then let yourself help or get yourself to help someone. Here's a telling question. Is there someone in this, on this planet whose walk, whose mission, whose existence depends on your support? Is there someone that you're speaking into to support them in their mission, their existence, and their walk with God? How would you support someone? Well, you'd show them acts of mercy, undeserved kindness. When they've failed, you say, do you know what? I'm with you. I'm with you. You, you show them support by, by time together and listening. I love seeing that happen on Sunday mornings and seeing vital conversations going on. You show them support by encouraging. I would have, I would have left this church years ago if it wasn't for the encouragement that, that I've received from the people of church at 109 and the visitors that come along and be part of church at 109. I'm quite sure I wouldn't be standing it just too hard without the encouragement. We, we support through words of encouragement and we support through prayer. It's, like I said, it's likely Aaron and her were both praying. So here we go. How do you protect your flanks? You obey God, you reach up, you reach out. Does our story finish there? Actually, no. It carries on. Just a few more minutes. Let's have a look. There's something vital we've got to pick up. The Lord said to Moses, write this down on a scroll as something to be remembered. So write it down on, a, on, a, on the only way of recording things back then. Pretty much was a scroll or a stone. So easier to write it down on a scroll. Moses is being told, put it in writing. It's something to be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears about it. Why does he need to hear about it? He knew what was happening. He was involved in battle. Joshua needs to hear about it because God is going to completely wipe out the name of Amalek from under heaven. So the Amalekites will get wiped out. It will take a while. Saul has a go, disobeys God in it. I think it's David that has a go afterwards as well and is more successful. Amalekites end up getting wiped out. Joshua needs to know about it. He needs to... Why? Because he's got much bigger battles coming. This is the easy one. He's got much harder things to come. He needs to look back at God delivering him from this one and say, right, I'm going into the next one. We need to write down our conquers, our, our winning battles to remember. Otherwise we forget or we, it fades away. I think that might be something to do with why Moses didn't just lift his hands in the air, but he lifted the rod of God in the air. 
was a rem- and why he was standing on the top of the hill instead of just down in the valley with them. The people are looking up, and there's Moses, and he's holding that 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 instrument that parted the Red Sea, that instrument of God that turned into a snake. And so they're looking and they're remembering God's God's victory and God's rescue and His action. So how do what do we do when we come to a battle and we win? When something goes well, we write it down. What happens when we get into our low points? We think back and we make a list and we say, this is where God stepped in today. This is where God stepped in the day before. This is where God stepped in the day before. Write it down. Tell your friends. Write a story of your history and the work of God through the ages. How has he shaped you and molded you and changed you over the years? How has he served in your life as you've served in his Write it down. Moses built an altar, verse 15, and he called it, The Lord is my banner. He said, Because hands were lifted against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Malachites from generation to generation. What's the name of the altar? The Lord is my banner. And I can hear you asking, What's the significance of a banner? I don't know. Can't really find a great answer. I I think I know. But the most commentators just skip over it. So banners were, were probably used in the Egyptian armies. The Egyptian armies divided into rank, uh, into into groups. Um, they go out into the war field. There's no intercoms. There's no cell phones. There's no way of communicating except for yelling. How do you know who you belong with in their army? Which group you belong with? Who's got your food? Who's got your supplies? Well, you'd look at the banner. And probably on the banner was the name of a god. And you'd go to that banner because that was your banner. For the nation of Israel, I've seen pictures, uh, artist impressions of the nation of Israel going through the wilderness and after they built the tabernacle, which isn't built yet, which was a kind of a temple on wheels, the, the people of Israel would camp in people groups, in tribes around the tabernacle. And how would the people know after their day's journey or their week's journey where their tribe was? Would they have to go around and find? There's millions of people. How would they find out? Well, there was banners. The, the tribe of Dan. And so they would go to the tribe of Dan and they'd find their family group and they'd be looked after and supported amongst their family group. What's the significance of saying the Lord is my banner? It's for us to say, do you know what? In this tough time, who am I sitting under? Who am I sitting under? And I talk to a bunch of Christians in church and we, we all sit under God. But actually when the tough times come, we go and sit off somewhere else. So who am I sitting under? Am I sitting under God? Who's your banner? Who's under your banner with you? It's clear from the story with the Amalekites that relationships and faith develop over time and shared experiences. So I've got an assignment for us. Are you excited? I've got some homework. Can't remember the last time I handed out actual homework, but this is homework for you. I won't mark it. You're welcome to discuss it through if you want. Grab a piece of paper and a pen or whatever electronic device you choose to use. Answer these three questions. Number one, where am I gathered? Should be an easy question. Which banner am I sitting under? Think about it. Over and over again, there's a little bit more to it. Whose banner am I gathered? Am I fully trusting and living under this banner of God? Second question, who's my team? Who's my team? Who are the people I support? Who are the people supporting me? Have you got some blank spaces on your roster that need to be filled? Who's my team? What's the first question? Where am I gathered? Second question, who's my team? Third question, what good things has God done? Write them down, it's so powerful. What good things has God done? Fill your list, fill your page. You'll absolutely fill a page or more with those three things. Where am I gathered? Who's my team? What good things can I remember? Let's thank God now. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for all the good things you've done in our lives. We thank you again for um, uh, f- for Andy and um, Gabriel and Esther and Eli and, and Arabella being back on the team again today. Um, you're so good, Father. Uh, thank you for the musicians in this church. Thank you for the servers in this church. Thank you for the kids under construction teachers teaching this morning. You're so good. 
Thank you for bringing Margie back from Romania. We pray that you'll uh, fix up her cold for her quickly. Thank you for every good thing you're doing in our lives. Thank you for the incredible people you've brought along this morning. Your 